So what I'm going to try to cover today really is, rather than just going over what, our, what the data sharing efforts are of the Thousand Functional Connectomes Project, I'm going to try to really go over uh, more of the scientific driving, uh, the, the driving force and motivations for data sharing and for the initiatives you see the Thousand Functional Connectomes Project doing. Uh, five, six years ago, if you told me I'd be heavily involved in open data sharing and all these things, I would say, no, what would I have to do with any of that? But it's the scientific model that really drove the thought of sharing and made us realize the need for sharing. And so I'm going to try to talk a, a bit about the, the, the model that, that, you know, what we're after, where we're going, and why data sharing, and not just data sharing, but other open science initiatives are so important for the functional imaging community. And to be clear, the examples I'm going to be using are resting state fMRI. Uh, in several instances, that, that's what my expertise is in. At the same time, it applies to just about any other sort of imaging you're going to go to with many, uh, look at with many concepts. So, so it's an easy thing to do. I no disclosures. Okay, so my background very heavily is in child and adolescent psychiatry, as well as in cognitive neuroscience and so forth. So that, you know, it's coming at, at imaging from from that perspective. The, the question is, well, what's the end game? And from the, from the psychiatric perspective and, and, and the neuropsychiatric perspective, really, the end game is really about biological tests. Uh, if you speak to any psychiatrist and also in varying aspects of neuropsychiatry, folks will tell you that we live in a world where we're the one branch of medicine that has no tests, no biological tests, nothing to guide us in everyday practice. And, and when it comes to psychiatry, where everything is based on history, if you do child and adolescent psychiatry, you don't just have a history from a child, you have a history from parent A, parent B, sometimes parents C and D, depending on what the constellation is. A teacher, it, there's a real loss of objective reporting. And psychiatry lives with a nosology that's really derived from the identification of constellations of signs and symptoms. And this is really a major challenge, not for trying to diagnose everyday garden variety ADHD, that's simple. If I showed you a kid with nothing else but ADHD, put him in a room, you would pick him out. But once that kid might have OCD in the picture, or maybe there's uh, depression, or maybe there's psychosis or mania, it's gonna get a lot more complicated. And that's just one example. It's, when we talk about imaging and medicine, sorry, and psychiatry, it's not that we wanna sit there and use imaging to sit there and check every child in the population. What we're talking about is using imaging in a way that will help to uh, help us find with those tricky cases where we need information to guide us in decision making or to guide us in treatment decision making. And here is just a sample of, of every psychiatrist's dream. So you have someone goes in for an image, you, you generate some connectome-like image, and you wind up with a report akin to a laboratory test that will then be another piece of clinical information to guide a psychiatrist in their day-to-day -day practice. We don't have this. There are many people who are trying to claim to have this in varying ways. People who come to see me because of my imaging expertise clinically, I tell them the best thing I'm going to be able to do is tell you don't use any imaging. None of it's going to guide you in clinical practice unless maybe there's a brain tumor uh, or MS or some of the other things, but not for the bulk of what we see. Uh, so really the question is, why don't we have biological tests? Uh, there's a perspective piece by uh, uh, NIMH director Tom Insel, which I'll talk about a little bit, which really speaks about many of the truths as to why we don't have, have these tests. Uh, and the thing you'll notice is I'm gonna speak a lot about the research, research culture rather than the actual science itself. And also there was a paper uh, that much of what I talked about draws from, which is a paper that we really adapted a lot of our thinking as well as some of the Insel commentary and brought it to functional imaging. Okay, any anytime we get, we get into these conversations, first thing we should all agree on is, what is a biomarker? So, uh, the one of the best lessons I, ever, I could ever give anyone I ever trained is Google. It's like the first thing you should ever do when you have a question is check Google. So, this came up the first time I checked Google and I felt good and was able to move forward in life. NIH Biomarkers uh, Working Group. So, basically, a biomarker is a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or a pharmacologic response to a therapeutic intervention. So what are we talking about? We're talking about an indicator. It's not necessarily meaningful uh, as far as what it is, but it's, giving, it's indexing some process, and that's what we're after. You know, when you talk about, well, what are potential biomarkers, everyone has their favorite. I, me, I, I like resting state fMRI, so I, of course I think it's God's gift to everything. But the thing is, someone that's looking at genetics is going to point to that, someone looking at morphometry. The bottom line is, there's a very broad array of, of potential candidates for biomarkers. And we really need to, uh, uh, to avoid 
honing in on anything prematurely. And this figure here by Builder and Poldrack is one of my favorites because I think it does a wonderful job of pointing out the many ohms and how they interact. And I love that's all within the environment. And, and this is something we need to keep in mind and the many levels that we're working out. So then comes again, what exactly is a biomarker useful for? The first thing everyone thinks about is diagnosis. In psychiatry, that is a little difficult because of the, we don't have a gold standard you're actually going against. We don't have any biological ground truths uh, to say this is the exact right thing you're going to predict biologically. We don't have any ground truths as far as I can sit there. And on the one hand, we've established increasing reliability in the psychiatric community by having uh, DSM-4 and other diagnostic manuals but they, there's questions about their validity in several instances. So you have an imperfect raters at best. But then also comes other uses that folks don't think of as much. For instance, staging of a disease. If you look at cancer, there are multiple examples in, in cancer where they, couldn't, you know, they didn't have a marker to say, you know, to say whether or not uh, the cancer is present for screening purposes, but they do have markers that can guide them in the staging of a disease. And incredibly important determinations of risk or prognosis. A child with with uh, pediatric anxiety, much higher risk being a child, uh, an adult with depression, uh, a child who's not verbal by five years, uh, who has autism, has a much worse prognosis in the long term for end outcomes. But what if you knew who that child was going to be at the age two? Maybe you could have intervened. When you hear, when people talk about an early intervention and prognosis, it is these determinations of risk that are so important. Uh, prediction and, and monitoring of clinical responses to an intervention. Right now, you make decisions based upon, you know, on, on what you've seen uh, in your own experience, on some, some papers that might be guiding you, lots of anecdotal things. You don't have clear things to guide you that, in this case, a stimulant will be better uh, than going with an alpha agonist when I'm treating a child with ADHD. In some other case, no, I'm better off going with the alpha agonist. And you could go back and forth. There are, there are vignettes and there are pieces of knowledge we have, but there's nothing objective that we could test to help with that response. And when you take a look at medications that have horrible side effect profiles, like neuroleptics, where you get weight gain, metabolic profiles, everything else, this would be incredibly useful. Now, this here is always a tricky issue. Uh, when it comes to what makes a biomarker clinically useful, you hear lots of people talk about, I got a biomarker, and they're very, very excited about their biomarker. And then you look at it, and you think to yourself, well, is it hitting the core profile, you know, is it hitting those core criteria of any clinical tests in any other realm? And there you talk about validity, reliability, sensitivity, specificity. How often in a literature that's coming out of the imaging world, when people are talking about biomarkers, how often are people putting their, their tests to these standards? Every other domain where you talk about laboratory tests, this information is provided. In imaging, there are many times where you see people bypassing this or misinterpreting and, and overselling. And of course, the other thing is widespread availability. I have the world's greatest test. If no one else has it but my one center, it's not really going to have an impact. Effect sizes. Now, this part here is the most sobering. Uh, this here is a diagram that we put in where, you know, it's a, it's a standard RC profile, but the thing is, the least impressive curve there has a, a cone effect size of, of 1.5. The most impressive is 3. Now, the least impressive 1.5, if you look at things like uh, PSA, prostate specific antigen, you'll see something that looks like that. And it has usefulness in screening and also has its downsides. The, the, the one with the effect size of three being the highest of them, that, that, that'd be much more useful for diagnosis. But the thing is, you gotta ask yourself, where are imaging, when you hear people saying, well, I think I have a putative biomarker, how many of your biomarkers are gonna have a curve even near the 1.5? And this is where you see a lot of misusage of the word biomarkers uh, in the community. And this is something we're really trying to get people to think about. What is it that you actually have? I promise the whole talk won't be depressing. Uh, at the heart of this, it comes down to the issue of everyone's chasing a P less than 0.05 significance level. And the thing is, that could be informative. I can learn about the brain from seeing these differences. I am not going to be able to sit there and do classification, prediction, or anything else from a clinical application point of view with P less than 0.05. Yet that's what the literature chases after. And in the insult paper, they refer to this as, as significance chasing. And they get into the issue of what people will do to get P less than 0.05, which just makes it all the worse. Because if you're having to hedge and, and make these little trade-offs to get to P less than 0.05, you really aren't going to do anything that's going to be helpful in the clinical realm as far as an application. Maybe neuroscientific me meaningful, 
but not, not from a clinical application point of view. Also, it's important to keep in mind that biomarkers, they're, they're associative by definition. They're not necessarily causal, and that's good and bad. That means that we might have a biomarker which tells us, you know, which gives, serves as an indicator, but it's not going to help us and inform us scientifically as to what the process is or the nature of it, just that it's there. But the other thing is, a biomarker does not necessarily have to convey neuroscientific meaning. And you'll see this fight go on in the imaging literature where some people want a model with a very limited number of features and nodes so they can interpret what their classifier is doing and feel very good about that. And then other people say, you know what, I got some incredible number of features, I'll do some selection, I'll get some meaning, I'll, I'll get some, some classifier, which maybe also has nonlinear properties and I may never be able to interpret what's going on there. But if the classifier works and can change someone's life, then who cares? Each, one, each side of this has, has merit. Uh, and once again, no best modality for biomarker discovery, no matter how much we all love our own. Uh, now, here's one of the big challenges, too, that I constantly I'm seeing, uh, which is validation. Now, leave one out is good for a cinder and, and testing uh, you know, proof of concept and feasibility and so forth, but you should not be talking about changing someone's life meaningfully in a clinic based upon leave one out or even K-fold replications. Uh, it's the difference between trying to convey an idea and a principle and say something's worth future a study and larger samples than to sit there and, and say, let's go, let's go with this. And I've been at conferences where I have a clinician who does some research come up to me and say, okay, I got this... Uh, you know, classifier, and I get 95% accuracy and would leave one out cross-validation, and I feel really good, and so I think I should start using it with my patients. What do you think? And my comments, no, don't do it, please. Uh, it, you know, start to investigate, create larger samples, start to look at then more stringent forms of validation. So, of course, now the ideal is independent replication samples, which if you're in the genetics community, you're looking at the imaging community and thinking, well, of course, you guys should know this. But the other thing is you also have to be careful because even when you go and get that independent replication sample, it does, it's not a guarantee because if you constructed that sample the same way you constructed your prior samples, you could have different biases in sampling. There could be lots of different aspects that your data may not be as representative representative as what you think. So it still can be confounded. So the, you know, it's actually a large problem. You know, the challenges here are significant, especially when you look in a field that, that until recent years has always been talking about 20, 30 subjects in, in, in each group. So then comes the excitement about connectomics. Uh, you know, and is the connectome better positioned to genetics? If someone is into connectome, uh, connectomics, of course I would point out, well, you know, neural system, the neural level is closer to the cognitive symptom and syndrome levels. So when you look at shared variants and from one level to the next, we're closer up in the tree and that we can go in both directions. People could go back and forth about this. Like I said, I'm someone from this literature, so I'm gonna talk with some examples from this, but everything I'm saying is pretty much more broadly applicable. As far as MRI-based prediction, you know, it is a growing reality. People are starting to, to get, you know, to, there, there is a growing number of papers emerging, uh, some with issues, you know, like with the resting state one to the left by Dossenbach et al, trying to look at brain maturity, and then on the right you have one with, uh, with using T1-based imaging, looking at, 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 at their index of brain maturity. Now you can see one is inferring that things are linear, the other nonlinear. One could go back and forth as far as differences in their sampling uh, of the age range, and one can also point out gaps in, in the sampling in the Dossenbach one. The point is we're starting to get there. Uh, the ADHD 200, years ago we had a global competition where we gave away the ADHD 200 data. We gave folks uh, at first about 80% of the data as, as to use for training and then we had kept out about 150 data sets uh, and gave those away uh, unlabeled and had people go forth and do their best. The good news was, well, a couple groups had, highly, had data that was highly specific. Uh, about 94% specificity. The downside is that group also had 20% uh, sensitivity. So if they were calling you ADHD, they were generally right, but, but they, they would miss many cases. That, that's from two years ago. Over the years, just by giving out this simple data set that was not really meant to be, it, this was an aggregate data set, it wasn't really meant to be used in any sort of, of way like this, we were actually able to, to really inspire a lot of folks to, to bring analytic methods in. And, and it's, I'm always impressed, each conference I go to, I always wind up seeing someone who's bringing the numbers up for the, uh, their ability to classify ADHD using data that was made openly available regarding the consortium. At the same time, this is once again a reason for sobriety. 
uh, and the Cassiano's paper that we did, we actually have a table that as of 2013, we looked at every resting state study uh, doing prediction and put together a comprehensive table that for each one shows you what's their sensitivity, specificity. We also give positive and negative, and negative uh, uh, you know, the, the real world prediction values. But one of the other things is for every one of them, we also indicate the validation techniques used. And it's very sobering when you look at this, that there's some signal there and there's something meaningful, but there's also lots of caveats because this is a very early field. Okay, when you look, and now going with resting state, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, are, are we being critical enough? Which is funny, because if you do resting state fMRI, all you, all you feel is like you're constantly criticized. We're like the noisiest signal on, on the block. But the thing is, when you look at any image, you're going to be asking yourself, what level uh, of validity have we met? Are we, have we done face validity, concept validity, criteria validity? These, these are, are key concepts that, that, uh, that other, you know, other scientific disciplines speak about constantly. Yet in the imaging literature, we actually tend to shy away from this. Uh, lots, you know, when you look at the initial Biswell work, that would be an example of face validity. It, it looked right. You know, he seeded a, a region in the motor system and the motor system lit up. That was very exciting. But the thing is, when you start asking about criteria validity, where you, are they considered with independent gold standards, that's a much uh, higher standard to hold yourself to, especially when you struggle with what are independent gold standards in which you're supposed to put your modality against. I'm going to talk about this more in a minute, but the other thing I'll point out is reliability. Reliability is, you know, on one hand, uh, myself and others have really pushed the importance of test-retest reliability for our measures. And for resting state, that becomes incredibly important because you have a state where people are, are relatively unconstrained. And so researchers would sit there and say, well, if you can't control what the person's thinking on two different occasions, you're never going to get meaningful test-retest reliability. And we were able to, to debunk that idea years ago and show you do get reliability. But reliability is not enough because artifacts can drive uh, reliability. And, I'll sh I'll, and, and, and that's a, ma a major concern. And I'll show you one, you know, one piece of information that should really make you consider that. But going back to validity for a second, if you take something like resting state fMRI, where folks can say, well, it's hard to, to establish validity, well, it's yes and no. For example, here, resting state fMRI, this is one of my favorite studies. This is by Steve Smith, where he basically took the brain map database, and what he was able to do is run independent component analysis on the brain map database and retrieve a set of, of, of functional networks that come out. And he ran independent component analysis on resting state fMRI from 36 subjects. In one case, you have thousands of contrasts from uh, over 1,000 studies coming together. In the other case, you have, I think it was like 36 subjects. And the bottom line is you get highly consistent networks emerging from these two analyses. That is something that really excites someone when you see that and think to yourself that this is two independent modalities coming together. Also, when you look at MEG literature, there's an increasing number of studies trying to compare resting state fMRI and findings of networks from MEG, once again showing a high degree of concordance between them. Here's a study that, uh, that Corey Keller and some of our other collaborators, we all work together on. Uh, we're using cortical, cortical evoked potentials. Looking at, at, at the millisecond scale, we were able to basically link patterns of, of uh, cortical activation from uh, stimulation during a ne from neurosurgery to what we get in the same subjects from resting state fMRI and show concordant patterns. This is one of the means we could go by establishing validity. Now it comes back, of course, to artifacts. Uh, and you hear people constantly talking about we need to standardize, standardize, standardize. Yes, we should as best we can. But we also need to be humble. No matter what you do, you will never have the perfect standardization you think you have in your MR protocols. You kept the same sequence, you kept the same scanner, and the bottom line is you can't control everything. So here's a paper, uh, pa table from a paper uh, we did a f uh, about a year and change back where we basically go through acquisition-related variables, experimental-related uh, variables, environment-related variables, participant-related variables. You know, you can't control sleep deprivation. You can't control whether or not someone's anxious in the moment. It's hard to even control whether or not they drank coffee, coffee before or took some sort of caffeine in, because you tell them not to, and they go ahead and they do it anyway. It's so whether or not they tell you. And anyone who needs an extreme example, look at substance use. When, you're, when the person who says they don't use substances comes up positive on a cocaine test done during the scan, well, that's telling you something. So instead, it does push for the idea that we need to, uh, to, to find different approaches for how to correct for these. And you know, there are classic examples of artifacts that live that we need to be wary of. And there's a whole literature that's come out about head motion and resting state fMRI. And uh, the reason why I say calmly in that is because the resting state fMRI community has not handled artifacts calmly. It's handled it somewhat hysterically at times. 
Uh, but you know, there, there is a large literature emerging for how to handle artifacts. And as someone who's in the field who reviews papers, the challenging thing is when you get a paper that doesn't take into account any one of these corrections. And, you know, it, there's no perfect correction, but you should at least be accounting for it. And there's definitely a need for folks to be adopting more and more. And then, of course, going back to the world where you don't have complete biological truths, you have the, the global signal argument with a resting state and the, the significant literature that's come out there. Uh, these are two examples of two of the most common artifacts. But, you know, these are things that folks need to be thinking about when they're looking at their findings. Uh, one consortium that we, another focus that I mentioned is reliability. In that regard, uh, one consortium that we recently put out is something called CORE, Consortium Reliability and Reproducibility. Now, as I said, years ago we established test retest reliability for a variety of measures, but that was with a subject, a data set of like 25 subjects, uh, imaged twice in the same session and once five to 11 months prior. And there are a series of other studies by other groups that emerge showing uh, you know, reliability and so forth. But this is still very much an open question, as well as asking what improves or decreases reliability for a measure. So with CORE, what we've done is we've pulled together data sets from uh, it's like eight, about 30 samples from 18 sites and pulled them together. It's about 1,600 subjects with over f almost 6,000 scans uh, combined from a variety of test retest designs. And we've made them all available through the 1,000 Functional Connectomes project. These have been up online since June. Uh, and, and openly available, anyone could go get them, pull them down, there's a variety of designs. It could be that you want 30 subjects who were scanned 10 times over the course of a month, three, month, uh, three days between each scan, with uh, ASL, diffusion, and resting state fMRI, or it could be you want two subjects who were scanned, I think it was like 45 times each. You know, there are different designs there. Uh, it's definitely worth taking data from. Going back to the issue of artifacts, just one little thing that I'll point to folks out is you constantly hear about motion. And one question you, you, that, you know, and this is the, something that those of us who play with this have always known, but it's not really pointed out enough. Motion itself, which is a potential confound in resting state fMRI, can be reliable. And actually, you're seeing that in this graph right here. If you take uh, mean frame-wise displacement at 0.2 millimeters, which is actually a decent amount of motion, but you go 0.2 millimeters and down, your correlation between session one and session two for uh, motion is about 0.6. Now, the interesting thing is you take really noisy data, motion, mean FDs above 0.2, well, there your correlation goes down. So I don't know if that should really make folks feel better that if you have really noisy data, it doesn't seem to be correlated. But the bottom line is, even when you have low noise, it's still something you need to be accounting for. Going back to the question of biological applications, you know, I just want to point out, everyone is talking more and more about diagnostic prediction. You constantly see folks doing it. But you have to keep in mind, there's lots of questions about the validity of the diagnostic system we use. It doesn't mean we should be throwing it out, because the reality is what's been built up allows for reliable communication between clinicians, which if we didn't have that, we'd go back about 20 years or so, and it'd be a wild, wild west version of practice. But we, we, you know, we, we do have to think, is that maybe the best goal or not? And so that's where there's been increasing push for stratified psychiatry, where you de-emphasize diagnosis and you start asking about risk, prognosis, things that, that we can quantify. And, and so I, you know, if, if I follow subjects over X number of years and, and, and see, you know, this, the, ask the question of, does someone with this marker, what, where are they 10 years from now, that's doable. Or if, if the question is, if I give someone a stimulant versus an alpha agonist, what's the response going to be and it's observed? These are the kind of things that are, are more tangible and we can really make concrete and have uh, more quantifiable results. Uh, okay, and so, for, so for the final part of things I'm going to do is just go back to that insult paper I'd mentioned. So the research challenge, like I said, lack of gold standard, that, that's a big one. But the bigger issue it comes down to research culture. And there, you know, one thing is the significance chasing, which I already mentioned. Another thing comes down to rec replication. In the imaging community, replication is far from a norm. And often when people say they replicate someone else's findings, what do they often do? They often say, well, it was in singulate. Singulate's pretty big. We're in singulate. And, and, and you know, how specific are you being in your reporting of findings? Usually not specific. Uh, and then extreme comparisons. This is another thing that came from the answer article, which I thought was really something that was well said and we don't say enough of, which is everyone is going with, okay, I have autism versus controls or schizophrenia versus controls. 
Now, first of all, did you really need imaging to figure out whether a child with autism is a typical, typically developing controller or not? I think if you just spoke to a child for just a little bit, you'd, you'd, you'd get the idea. So the question really is, is this autism? Or maybe this is a child with ADHD and expressive and receptive language uh, uh, disorders. Or, or, or maybe the, the, the child is psychotic. There are lots of different, or, or has very severe OCD. There are lots of different uh, things that creep into differentials. And if we're gonna ask of what's more meaningful in imaging, we should be comparing uh, disorders to one another, rather than just a single disorder versus uh, a, a typically developing population, which if you think about it, let's say you come with the best classifier in the world for autism, for autism versus typically developing children, have you established something that's useful? The answer is who, who knows? Maybe I could put a child with ADHD in, and that classifier is gonna work just as well in saying the kid has ADHD, or sorry, or not. You know, it's, the, the, the problem is you haven't established specificity. We need to understand specificity, and that, that's a major challenge. All this goes back to the issue for, uh, you know, we, we need big data. Uh, you know, the, the idea of significance chasing, I said, you can't do these studies with 15, 30 subjects. Going back to why would someone like myself, who initially had zero interest in data sharing six years ago, and all this open science and so forth, be such a strong advocate nowadays? The reality is, at that point, I started building a much larger resting state fMRI data sets than what most people had, and I quickly realized they're useless. They're useless unless I start combining them with other people's data, unless I change the scientific model. And, and that's, you know, it's not that I have any problems with the utility of the method I'm using. I think it could be very powerful. It's the scientific model that's the challenge. Uh, Going back to the issue of what to do about validity and, and of the psychiatric system we use. So the NIH has been pushing the research domain criteria project. The idea here is that we should break uh, psychiatric illness down into a set of different constructs and domains. And within each domain, you know, construct, whether it be working memory, whether it be negative valence, so forth, you come up with these grids that have you know, the genetic layer, molecular, cell, circuit, physiology, behavior. This is just a tiny piece of the, of, of the RDOC uh, plan. And the second you look at this, it's overwhelming. And the question of what kind of data model is needed for this, in my mind, that's screaming big data. I mean, if that's not gonna be big data, I don't know what is. To fill in those grids with any sort of completeness is a massive challenge. Uh, so, you know, on the one hand, the RDOC is very good in exciting us and realize, making us realize the weaknesses of what we've been doing and basically saying what many of us have said for years. On the other hand, it can be misapplied in different ways, which it's, it's not all a compensating answer and there are lots of caveats and so forth, but it is pushing us more and more to rethinking scientific approach. And what's the scientific approach becoming more and more? It's, it's, it's data-driven analysis, which as someone who's a background in cognitive neuroscience, that was not, a, when I was in grad school, that would be sinful. If I'd say, well, what about this or that? I'd hear, well, would you have a hypothesis? And it's like, no, well, then it doesn't matter. And I'd be like, what do you mean it doesn't matter? It's there. But this here is one of the challenges that we faced for years. I, I love pointing to this paper from Damien Fair, which actually has zero brain imaging data in, in, in it at all, though this has also recently been done with brain imaging data, where they sat there and took uh, about 250 subjects with ADHD, 250 without, took neuropsych profiles for each, did a data reduction, and then built a graph where each node in a graph is, is actually a subject. And what he did is he went and carried out subject community detection. So he looked for communities of subjects in a sample where half the individuals had ADHD and half didn't. Now, the first thought that many would have is, okay, great, we're gonna find this ADHD cluster and versus this, AD, this uh, typically developing cluster, and then within ADHD, maybe we'll find some heterogeneity. What they found was actually quite different. They found that there is no ADHD cluster. Instead, what you get is six cognitive profiles that emerge across kids with ADHD and without, and then when you look in each cluster, ADHD winds up modifying the profile within that cluster. And that would, if you think of ADHD and the many presentations that, that comes with it, that would actually partially explain why, you know, why is it that we see what we see clinically. Is that something that someone would have thought of just sitting around and, and kind of hypothesis? Probably not most of us, maybe someone. 
But this is the potential value of what we can do. And as I said, this has recently been done with imaging. Uh, uh, Zhe Yang and, and Xian Zhuo, they recently took uh, uh, an ICA-based approach and wound up showing that they could differentiate individuals with schizophrenia from those without using default network connectivity and, and, and using subject community detection. And then they showed with another network they were able to differentiate positive versus negative symptomatology. Keep in mind, what we're talking at the heart of all this, what we need is knowledge. Uh, knowledge is going to be essential. Here's an example uh, from the NK Rockland of what our phenotyping looks like for a lifespan. This is two days' worth of phenotyping we put folks through, uh, where we have these comprehensive assessments. Uh, what you're seeing on the right in a given line uh, is what questionnaire is given based upon age. But there's a huge amount of information collected. Going from an informatics perspective, you can see the science, if you adopt these models, you're mandating uh, use of powerful informatics, otherwise you will very quickly cripple yourself. Here in this example, what we wound up doing is building everything in with coins uh, from Mind Research Network, and what we did is we have their assessment tools do all the capture of all questionnaires, of all items, so we have individual item data for everything, and we were able to, 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 to make this more tractable in our operation. And actually, once we switched away from paper and pencil, despite an initial few months where I was a very unpopular person for doing it, ever since, the team wouldn't think of doing it otherwise. Um, going back to big data, uh, you know, the reality of big data is what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand complex systems through application of data-intensive, data-driven approaches. Uh, the thing is, you're not coming up with hypotheses, but you can't just look and say, big data, give me an answer. I mean, you hear these people, people get really magical with this. So what you need is a range of questions. You, know, you need a specific question that you have in mind, and when you build a big data resource, you need to have anticipated the range of questions people may want to ask. If you don't do that at the beginning, then you basically lose out in the end. And even when you do the best of jobs, you find that one thing that you're like, I really wish we had that in our sample, but, but we don't. Uh, as far as our doc congruence with big data, like I said, it's absolutely consistent with, 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 the, with the model of, uh, of trying to break psychiatric illness down into all these pieces and building up. So I spent a lot of time getting beat on by, by folks over the issue of big data and neuroscience. So this year was my attempt at trying to find a way to explain to people, it's not that we're saying hypothesis-driven science should die. It's far from it. If you have hypothesis, test it. But you know, the thing is, as you use here, if anyone's familiar with AA, this really helps a lot of people with disorders get through tonight, and I think it could help the imaging community. So again, really, this oppositional thing between big data and hypothesis testing really needs to, to, to calm down. And it's, I've seen pockets where it is and pockets where I, it doesn't go so well. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, we're going to get into the fight soon of what's big data. Is 1,000 subjects really big data? From a sample size perspective, probably not. If it's 1,000 subjects with thousands and thousands of observations, probably you're getting there. And you could argue about where to put uh, the, the number. But we also have, have to be practical in expectation. When you look at genetics community, they're not even talking about 10,000. They're talking about 100,000 plus. And, you know, you kind of hope from a connectomics perspective we could do better because we're closer to the behavioral level and so forth. Maybe that's true, maybe not. But it, even, it, you know, one of the last few points I want to make is uh, representative sampling strategies is a huge issue, and I'll talk about those more in a second, but you can't speak beyond your data. So if your data don't sample a particular population in an appropriate manner, you've just, you could have all the data you want. The bottom line is if you left out a particular population or you over-biased things in the ways of some subpopulation, you're not going to get informative results. Because sometimes I think people think if I have a lot of subjects, then that's... Then, then that's the solution. So when you look at something like the Generation R study happening here in the Netherlands, that, 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 that's a gorgeous example of having an epidemiologic sample, which that, you know, from someone who, uh, who's sitting over in the States, I'm just beyond envious of, of that initiative. Uh, you know, it, it, you, need the, you, you need representative sampling strategies, and then you need everything else. You need data-intensive hardware, you need automated uh, quality control metrics, which is tricky. If you notice, I put the word consensus there. Good, good luck trying to get consensus in the imaging community. We're getting better, but it, the, the fight continues. And you need sophisticated data-driven exploratory techniques. Uh, on the one hand, people have been doing data exploration for years. It's called ICA. On the other hand, there's a much broader range of techniques that need to be considered. And you know, the thing is, it's, as a psychiatrist, I, mean, I may have a background from my younger years in computer science, but at the same time, I'm pretty humble to sit there and say, I'm not going to be able to go and compete with the, the best machine learning theory guy on the block, because when, when I was in college, we weren't learning machine learning theory. 
you know, and the thing is, I don't expect myself as a psychiatrist to turn into that. I expect myself to find collaborators. And the reality is, a guy doing the best SVM on the block, first of all, maybe SVM is not even the best approach, but if it is, he doesn't know what, what, what questions to ask because he's not a psychiatrist so, or a neuroscientist. So it's a collaboration that, that's what's needed. Uh, last part of what I just want to talk about is data sharing. Let's just put the numbers in perspective. If it costs me $1,000 on average for a non-clinical sample, which if I take scanner time and really expedited phenotyping, maybe I could pull off, the bottom line is for 1,000 subjects, it's a million dollars. Once you start talking about a low difficulty clinical sample, all of a sudden you're talking at least 2,500. By the time you get to uh, a high uh, difficult population like autism, by the time you go through the assessments, by the time you have someone who's trained with research reliability, by the time you have the support staff to guide that individual who's going to tax your staff a lot more to get through the magnet, you're at least looking at about $10,000 a subject. I base these numbers on, on our own grant applications as well as some of others. Uh, 10, 000, 1, 000 subjects is, is a huge investment. And the thing is, for, to, to, to ever accomplish that and have five or six papers come out from that sample and have that as, be the life of the sample is a huge travesty. Uh, when you look at the genetics community, back in 1996 with the Human Genome Project, the Bermuda Principles, they said, release everything as quickly as possible. Don't put these delays in. Make things public. Go for transparency. You know, the, these base principles, they're, they're talking about making things open and aggregating and making it a game of leapfrog, which is what open science should be. Not to sit there and, and play the research silo game, which the imaging community has, has definitely dragged on for many more years. Uh, here, I'm going to finish up with is looking at uh, the 1,000 uh, Functional Connectomes Project. What it represents is grassroots data sharing. Uh, no one paid us from the beginning to, to share data. <laughs> no one really pays us anything much still to, to share the data. It would be nice. Uh, the, the bottom line is these are grassroots initiatives where we wind up forming consortiums of people who all have a like-minded interest around a particular disorder or topic and say, would you give your 30 data sets? Would you give your 30 data sets? By the time we're done, if we have 1,000 data sets or even only 500, you all will do better as a community. And what you're seeing on the right, so, so there's the initial release back uh, in, in, in the, with the 1,000 Functional Connectomes Project. Uh, that was Rob Biswell and myself had co-founded and directed that one. And that, their data we had released with age and sex. So very quickly, we went with a bunch of papers looking at age and sex. And then realizing the need for a deeper phenotyping and more enriched samples and so forth, I went and founded the International Neuroimaging Data Sharing Initiative. And under this, we've had the Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange, the ADHD 200, uh, the Rockland sample, which is actually a, a slightly different model. Here we do pre-publication sharing. This here is a sample that, that I've been generating for the last four years, and we just give it away on a regular basis. Uh, just to give you an idea of what's the impact of that kind of philosophy, we just checked the other day. There are 46 publications since 2010 using uh, uh, the Rockland sample data. I've had seven of them. So does that mean I should be working more? Maybe. Or it means that the community is doing pretty well and that sharing you know, really has huge merits. And I don't have to, you know, I don't have to, if I was to sit there and think, what's it going to take for me to get 46, data pa you know, 46 papers in order to then really, it would have been horrible. So people really, if you give them data, they, they will be excited about it. And, and you know, with ADC 200, there have been over 60 papers generated by that. Uh, the, the abide, uh, there's only like six or seven so far, but there's a huge number I've been seeing in, in uh, conferences. Abide was just released a year and a half ago, and then Core is the newest on the block. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is at any point in the last five years, oh, sorry, four years, if we go and look at Google Analytics, we will get a map that looks like this. Uh, this is what the audience for a thousand functional connectomes project looks like. Uh, these are example papers generated by our group. These are announcement papers. Uh, so this is the 1,000 Functional Connectomes Project. This was the consortium paper. And we actually did look at sex effects. Like I said, it's one of the things we could. Uh, then comes Indy looking at subtypes of ADHD uh, in the ADHD 200, which you couldn't do with a small data set. It, the the Abide Consortium resolving a controversy as to whether the brain's hyperconnected or hypo. Turns out it's both. Uh, how is this kind of data used? Here's a quick survey that was done. You can see doctoral theses, papers, pilot data for grants. This is the way you want a community operating. Uh, it's, you know, it, there's plenty of room for any person. Uh, standardization of data, here's a paper that we had done, uh, Chagan Yan et al. in our group. 
uh, where it, because we had this aggregate data set, we had to come up with, with how, do, how do you account for all the variation and what could we do to take into account uh, site-related differences. So we, we wound up borrowing from the gene expression literature a variety of different kind of post hoc statistical approaches and showing their potential utility. Once again, if the data wasn't available, these kind of questions couldn't be asked. The same thing with dirty data, like with, with data that has poor quality. People often be like, why would you release that? And my answer is because I want us to be able to evaluate uh, quality across sites. I also want us to be able to actually motivate folks to come up with more advanced corrections. And of course, as I said, phenotyping is key. One last note on representativeness. Um, with the Rockland sample, we've gone through great lengths to try to sit there and do a community ascertained design so that we're sitting there representing different zip codes. And I will admit, it's very hard. Uh, like I said, I'm so, I'm, that's, I'm so envious of the Generation R for what they pulled off. I mean, it is hard getting uh, folks recruited and going through all this, and it costs a lot of money, and it's absolutely what's needed in the field. Uh, on the horizon, uh, this here, the Abide Preprocess Initiative, uh, four different pipelines in the resting state community, the date that each of the pipeline representatives had taken the data and uh, you know, had agreed to take the Abide data and preprocess it. So now uh, this is actually readily available for download, preprocessed data, and, data uh, and derived data from these four initiatives using the same data set. So you could compare the uh, initiatives. Also, back when we did Abide, uh, we had taken the same data set and spoke to each one of the database. Uh, you know, if, if folks are producing databases in, in, in the resting state community, each one of, of the uh, developers, and they all took the same data set and put it in, in their uh, respective databases to allow for comparison of the databases. I think a lot more initiatives like this are needed to really get people to understand what databasing options exist. A lot of people don't realize there are actually some very good databases out there, and they really present good options and solutions. And last thing is, everything I spoke to you about is inhuman. Uh, we know resting state and the functional imaging approaches and morphometry could be used for, the, for monkey and translational. I strongly suggest we start thinking about sharing that data. And I will skip the last two and leave it there. Okay. Thank you so much for your talk. This is great. Um, one thing that you didn't really address, or I, I may have missed it, is the provenance of each data sample as it moves from one database to another, which this data really has done. Um, so from where I sit at NIF, it's very hard for me to figure out, is this actually a different sample than the one I've got over here? So if you could address that question mm -hmm. just a little bit, that'd be great. Oh, no, that, that was, well, so, so there are many levels of provenance. One is just even when you start with, with, the, with the MRI images that are being shared, you could get into trouble. Most of the sharing we've had has used NIFTY, uh, where folks have gotten rid of most of their metadata, uh, which is challenging. And, you know, the DICOM would be more optimal, though it's more difficult getting folks to share and handle the DICOM format. Uh, but even at that grain, there are challenges, which we, we've been working to try to get folks to, to, to give us dumps directly from the magnet and so forth. Nothing's perfect. As far as going metadata beyond your images, that is a, a key issue. One of the things I keep saying about the phenotyping, you know, right now people have a tendency to only to, to share the bare minimum information, even in their papers, frankly, about their sampling strategies used and, and, and who they've actually characterized. So I say there are two levels of the problem there. First, they themselves need to better characterize the data sets. And, and, and then you could talk about, well, how do we share those descriptions? With the NKI Rockland there, the thing that's made it possible for us is really you know, the, the, the usage of a sophisticated informatics system. Uh, if you're doing electronic data capture, your life is not so difficult, then you just need to make sure you've captured the, the information and it can be maintained and then shared. Uh, there is the issue, of course, linking one database to the next, which that there is between the database developers, and I know uh, some of the different initiatives are working to try to create interoperability between the databases. Uh, but the other thing is the fact that a lot of this information is just not logged, and I think that's where the, the biggest challenge in my mind is to get the, the data generators to essentially start using informatics, to start using something more than an Excel spreadsheet. You know, for, if, if you sit in a seat of the Thousand Functional Connectomes Project uh, in Indy, we see everyone's data because we get these files in CSV, XLS, SVS, and it, we see a lot of the dirt at the labs. And we, we appreciate that people are opening up and sharing it. And then we spend a lot of time going back and forth saying, what did you mean here? Could you check this here? 
and we go through this. So I think it's a working problem, but it starts with getting the labs to, to change their behaviors, and it filters up towards the databases being able to communicate efficiently and could switch data dictionaries, all these kind of issues. Michael, thanks a lot for the talk. It's, uh, it's wonderful to hear you on the... Uh, and there's so much uh, that you've done that is actually shaping a lot of the data sharing in uh, neuroimaging. It's, uh, it's just uh, amazing. And, uh, uh, and yeah, and, and the, yeah, a lot is going to happen because of those initiatives and the, you know, the, uh, and uh, it's, uh, yeah. So apart from that, there's so much, I mean, many of the points you raised could, you know, warrant a, a whole talk. Uh, but there's one point you never raised, which I was a bit surprised, is that there is a, a classical excuse for not sharing data, which is the ethical approval. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, I've got my answer on that, uh, but I, I would be, you know, I'd be pleased to have yours. Uh, yeah, no, that, 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 that's an important question, and with one of the multiple levels. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, the first thing I would say is it's going to always come down to the local IRB or ethics board. And so for the Thousand Functional Connectomes, we've always asked folks to go and get approval from their ethics board. Generally, what happens is if it's a data, you know, the first question is where folks consented for sharing. If the, if the individuals in a participants in a study weren't consented for sharing, now you could jump into, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily end there. Now it comes down to what kind of information is being shared. Uh, do the risks outweigh the benefits of the sharing? And also, how are you sharing the data? So if it's like Thousand Functional Connectomes Project, uh, where we were just giving away age and sex, no IRB uh, really required, well, actually, that's not true. Three IRBs said that they would need to go and consent. Everyone else said, look, risks, uh, risks are outweighed by the benefits here. Just go ahead and share. Uh, as we've gone through the India initiatives, we've seen variation where in some of these initiatives, the IRBs have said, you should go ahead and reconsent. And, and like for Abide, uh, there were several sites which did reconsent, and then other sites said no, uh, that they, they disagreed with that. I had, we had one site where two investigators going to the same IRB had different answers, so one reconsented, the other one didn't. Uh, you go through this process. Uh, when you start sharing things like the, like, uh, the NKI Rockland data set there, we have something called NKI Rockland Lite, where it's just images, age and sex, and handedness. That anyone can grab. But if you want that high dimensional data, which contains uh, all the diagnostic information and everything, you have to go through and sign a, a, a legally binding uh, data usage agreement between the two institutions. We in no way restrict your analysis in any way other than you can't re-identify. Uh, you get in, you know, and, and then comes the, the hard part, which is right now, if you have any idea you might be sharing, and we all do, then the question is, if you're looking at what needs to change quickly, is every person entering a research study should be given the right to know whether or not, whether or not their data may one day be shared. And, you know, so it, it, it is a complex issue, but I don't think it's a good excuse not to share. If anything, they should be able to sit there and say, when's through my IRB and my IRB told me no way, or my IRB uh, said you have to go reconsent a bunch of people that I couldn't possibly reconsent. Uh, beyond that, I don't, I don't think there is so much weight in, in the claim. Yeah, what I'm getting at is, you know, putting the burden of the ethical use uh, of the data. So I mean, you know, it's something different from you know, getting something which is ethically acquired. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the, you know some, somebody could actually, have, you know, get the ethical approval for the use of the data. And that's a thing. And the other thing is possibly putting the ownership of the data to the subject themselves, uh, which is another, uh, you know, like a... Yeah. yeah, well, so you could get into, you know, and, and I, I know uh, just uh, last week in Leiden, they, they were, they, they were, there was an intriguing conference, actually, going through these issues with ownership of data. And, I, I, you know, my, my comment on this is we need to look at other literatures uh, and, and not act like we're making this decision in isolation. If you look at the clinical trials literature, they've been working on for years who owns data in farm trials and things like that. And it typically does go with the idea that it's not the investigator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, there, there's a variety of variations.